is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. Shall there be one Lord and his name one. And she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lord. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Let's lift our hands and let's worship that King tonight. Praise God. Last night was a great night. Today has been a wonderful day. And you know what caps it all off is the good Word of God. Praise the Lord. We're going to ask that there be no unnecessary running in and out. Trust everybody's got your cell phones off, your pages off, and uh, everything's taken care of because we're going to hear from the Lord. You want to hear from the Lord? Before Brother Alviar comes, let's just lift our hands and ask God to talk to us through the word of the Lord tonight. Oh, God, talk to us. Talk to us. Talk to us, Lord. Glory to God. Praise God. Over the years, over the years, in this, this meeting, over the years, I'm telling you, God has absolutely talked to us. And there's been moments and times that we have found direction. And uh, we're happy tonight to have Brother Alviar with us in South Louisiana. And Brother Alviar is, he is not just a preacher, not just a pastor, but he is a real Christian and a man of God. Brother Alviar and I, our, uh, our paths cross here and there and wherever and meetings sometimes. Uh, we're preaching together, being together. And over the years, I have really learned to love and appreciate this good man. Praise God. I appreciate what he believes, and I appreciate his good spirit. Spirits make men. Praise God. Spirits make men. And uh, I really love him and appreciate him. And uh, I just, we haven't done it this way before, but I've asked him to preach tonight and also tomorrow. And I've just felt that. Praise the Lord. And I want him to come right now. And let's give our undivided attention to the word of the Lord. Let him hide in the shadow of the cross, but hear the voice of the Lord. Let's worship the Lord as brother. Clap your hands to the Lord tonight. Would you do it? Praise God. Hallelujah. He is worthy. He is worthy. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Elder Morton. We are just so happy to be here again this year at West Coast Conference grateful for what the Lord has done over the years in the times that we have been privileged 
to attend and uh, and also honored to the minister here has been uh, just high water mark times in my life and uh, I am so appreciative uh, of what God has done here over the years in these meetings as has already been expressed tremendous preaching my life has been changed a number of times and I believe that it is happening again this year I appreciate so much what we have already heard last night and today uh, these good men that have preached brother Pixler and also uh, brother uh, Deathridge and uh, also brother Brown they have blessed our hearts their messages have been so timely and so needed and I believe that the men that are preaching tomorrow will also be likewise. Praise God. And what a beautiful assembly of people that are here tonight. This does not happen accidentally. You can go a lot of places around the country and you will not see a crowd like you see here tonight. And I'm not talking about number-wise. I'm talking about how people look and how people act and how they worship and how they respond to preaching and that is a tremendous credit to the caliber of leadership that you are blessed and privileged to have amen thank God for men who are not afraid to take a stand and preach the word of the Lord in this hour Amen. If you've ever needed a preacher in your life, you need him today. I said, if you've ever needed a preacher in your life, you need him today. Amen. We salute Elder Morton and his great vision and great burden. Uh, I likewise have so enjoyed being with him a number of times over the last several years and uh, just uh, honor and esteem him so highly and have nothing but the greatest admiration for him, the work that he has done, is doing. God is certainly blessing it, and I count it a tremendous honor to be asked to come and minister tonight. And it is my fervent desire to say something that would make a difference. I mean that would make a difference. Praise the Lord. Amen. Did you come to hear the word of the Lord tonight? I feel, I feel something different on my heart tonight than what I'm accustomed to preaching. But uh, it's what I really feel. And I have struggled much within myself, but I feel very certain that I am in the will of God tonight. You will turn in your Bibles in the book of Mark chapter 1. The book of Mark chapter 1, and then I'm going to read a few verses also from Matthew chapter 9. Praise God. Good to see so many of my preacher friends here tonight, and some I'm just getting acquainted with, but it is a privilege to be with each and every one of you. Praise God. Mark chapter 1, beginning with verse 32. The Bible says, And at even, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and them that were possessed with devils. And the city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many that were sick of divers' diseases, and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, 
all men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee, and cast out devils. A very familiar passage in Matthew chapter 9, beginning with verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Hallelujah. I'd like to preach to you tonight on this simple subject. I want to talk to you about the harvesters. The harvesters. Would you lift your hand and ask God to help us talk to us tonight. Come on, I want to hear you. I want, to, I want you to lift your voice up. I want you to beseech the Lord tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, we need more than a token prayer right here. We need the Holy Ghost to come down and meet with us tonight. Hallelujah. Oh, great God, I need you. I need you tonight, Lord. I confess again freely that I can do nothing without you. I need your help. I need your anointing. I need your unction. God, would you speak through this humble vessel tonight? Hallelujah. Let your will be done. Oh, God, I don't know what you want to do here tonight, but I pray that your will might be done in this house. Praise God. Come on, we need to punch through something here this evening. We need to punch through something. We need to get past the ordinary. We need to climb up another notch. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, God. Come on, is there anybody that knows how to touch the Lord here tonight? Praise God, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Ah, oh, one more moment. Come on, put your hand up. Put your hand up. Reach up into the divine right now. Ask the Lord to have his way. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Turn, or you may be seated tonight if you will. Amen. Let me, uh, I, I feel like I need to preface this message tonight by saying that there are many, many topics and issues of great significance before the church in this hour. There is a long list of challenges uh, that we are facing, both within and without the church. We're dealing with complexity today that I believe would baffle King Solomon. Amen. Uh, we're, we're having to cope with advances in technology, for instance, that 
that have a scrambling to find a safe and tenable position to take. Praise God. We're dealing, as we heard uh, this morning, with compromises in the area of doctrine that we never thought we would have to deal with within the ranks of Pentecost. And uh, I don't know about you, but, but I, I come to meetings like this seeking answers and, and listening for solutions. I come with my heart open. I want God to speak to me and to give me direction and instruction. And I say that to say this, that, that there is a whole lot that we could preach tonight that would seem more important than the message that I feel on my heart tonight. Amen. And, and in fact, I will tell you that when it comes to the area of evangelism, I, I do not feel qualified to deal with this subject. There are many men present in this place that are far more adept and far more successful in this area than perhaps I may ever be. I, I do not come tonight as a teacher. I come as a student. I, I do not come as an authority on the subject, but I come as an observer and as one who am willing to learn. Hallelujah. And although the assembly where I pastor has doubled during my tenure there, I do not feel successful. But much of the time, like many, I feel that I am struggling just to hold on to those that I have. Praise God. And yet there is something that is burning down in my heart tonight. I have felt for the last several days the Spirit of the Lord brooding upon my spirit, and I can't get away from it. And I feel the necessity, and I feel compelled to add my voice to the discussion and to submit my little insights, amen, for your consideration. Uh, there are a lot of directions that I could go in tonight. And, and be on much safer ground than I feel right now. In fact, late this afternoon, amen, I tried to cop out, and I tried to go a different direction, but I felt as though it were a stern rebuke from the Holy Ghost. I really do believe that God wants to talk to us here tonight. Amen, I, I kind of feel a little out of sync with this meeting so far. It just almost seems like what I have to preach does not fit what we've already heard. But I can only obey the Lord this evening. And I hope that you will allow me to do that. Praise God. Uh, let me tell you something else. Uh, there, there's a lot of times when, when we come to a meeting like this to preach. Uh, at least let me speak for myself. Uh, amen. We come with more than a message. Uh, we bring more than a message to the pulpit, but rather, amen, we, we bring a composite of everything that we are and, and all of our life experiences and, and what we have felt and what we have seen and what we have heard, amen, and, and we come to the pulpit with the whole package, our hopes and our fears, our dreams and our visions, Amen. Whatever little knowledge that we've been able, uh, by the help of the Lord, to accumulate. And even sometimes uh, our opinions. And, and we step to the pulpit with that whole package. It's more than just a sermon. But it is a man pouring forth the essence of his soul. And this is one of those nights uh, when I feel that tonight. Uh, amen. Because sooner or later, praise God, our most fundamental motivators are going to come through and, and are going to be revealed and folks are going to get a glimpse into your soul. And, and tonight, if the Lord will help me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up a little window and let you see deep down 
inside of my being. Amen. I guess one way of putting it is if I was an automobile and, and you were to strip off the doors and the bumpers and, and the plastic and the veneer and the seat covers and all of the doodads and gadgets and bells and whistles and get it down to the chassis. Amen. It would be simply this. If you want to know the car of my whole existence and what makes this man tick, it is simply this. I am the son of a missionary. I grew up on the mission field, and it is that that burns and beats within my heart every single day. If you boil it down to its most essence and essential, that is what it would be. Amen. I grew up in Sao Paulo, Brazil, what is today the second largest city in the world. Amen. I grew up as a young child accustomed to the noise and the din and a cacophony of sounds in that massive city. The congestion, the traffic jams, the horns are blaring, the smells and, and the sights along the way, the density of population that unless you have ever been there, it would be very hard for you to comprehend or envision. Praise God, thousands and even tens of thousands of voices echoing in your ears. Praise the Lord. And, and surrounded with, uh, with uh, just a concrete jungle, every direction that you look. When you fly into the city of Sao Paulo, amen, it stretches from horizon to horizon. It has more than twice the number of skyscrapers as New York City. And yet, in, and among the gleaming high-rise buildings, there are hundreds and even thousands of shanty towns. Amen. Each one of them with tens of thousands of people that you never get to meet on any day. They are born and they die there in squalor, in misery, and in poverty. Amen. As a child, I knew what it was to step around beggars on the sides of the street and people with all types of deformities and their hands stretched out seeking for alms. It was a sight that unsettled me as a child and it still troubles me today. The street people everywhere you looked, amen, they tell me that over 30,000 people a day are streaming into the city of Sao Paulo, Brazil, seeking their fortune. And once they get there, they have no jobs, no place to live. They end up in crime, in prostitution, just living on the street trying to survive. I remember one time, at one point, we lived in a house, in an apartment. It was on the third floor of an apartment building. It was in the market area of the city. And there the trucks would roll in early in the morning, coming from the farmlands. And they would bring in, amen, the produce from the farms and offload them there in these holding areas from where they would then be dispatched to the grocery stores and whatever. And in the afternoon when the trucks would leave and the streets would clear, here would come the street people from everywhere. And they would start crawling into the dumpsters and digging around for rotten potatoes and rice and beans and haul it out and cook it on the streets. And they would feed their families that way. As a small child, I leaned out the windowsill and I watched them. Amen. Those memories are ever with me. Hallelujah. Amen. Some of my earliest recollections as a young boy is going to church just about every single day. Amen. We had a number of churches in the Sao Paulo area, and so we were in, the, in church virtually every single night. We had no automobile in those days. We rode buses and taxis and trains, and we walked long distances on foot. 
sometimes in the darkness of night, amen, in the middle of nowhere, perhaps not even really aware of the danger that surrounded us, but God kept his hand on us. I went to bed many, many, many a night, amen, way in the middle of the night to rise early and go to school in the morning. I huddled in little uh, ramshackle buildings, uh, no heating or air conditioning. Uh, amen. It was cold in the winter time, uh, and yet the windows and the door would be open always uh, so that the people out in the street, uh, amen, could see and hear what was going on inside of the church. Uh, amen. While we put on uh, several layers of clothing, uh, and sat there and shivered in the cold or we were uh, very hot and sweaty in the summertime i hope you'll just let me say what i feel like saying amen my whole childhood was spent going to church every single night somewhere hallelujah as an 11 year old child i would get on a bus from where we lived and i would go downtown by myself in the middle of millions of people, we had a church on the 17th floor of one of the oldest high-rise buildings in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And there my dad had services every day. And I would go there and sweep the hall as an 11-year-old child and then get on a bus and go back home by myself. Amen. That's the way it was all the time. These are the memories that motivate me. These are the things that haunt me to this day. Amen. I'm just here to tell you tonight that I am at times mindful of the enormity of the task that we have before us. Hallelujah. Amen. And I'm going to tell you that though we have accomplished a lot, and I am grateful for every addition and for every soul that God has added to our churches and blessed us with. Amen. Can I tell you, and I'm just speaking for myself, I feel that we are falling behind. I do not mean to alarm you. Amen. Somebody is sure to think tonight that, that Jonathan Alviar is going off the deep end. Amen. That he is about to join the charismatic movement. Amen. You can rest assured that's not about to happen. Amen. I am not naive enough to think that we are going to win the whole world. And I am well aware of the logistics that we're dealing with and the dynamics of what we're up against and the great needs that are there versus our meager resources. I am aware of the odds that are stacked against us and of the spirits of this age that we're having to deal with. I understand the prevailing darkness that is descending and I know about the oppressive power that is bearing down upon every one of us. I know about the wholesale deception that surrounds us and the infatuation with error that seems to be taking whole churches down, amen, the garden path, the seduction of the entertainment industry that's finding its way even within the ranks of Pentecost, and the love of pleasure more than lovers of God. I know, amen, that we are having to contend with things perhaps that we never thought we have to contend with. We are facing the unprecedented in the dysfunctional and the unnatural. Can I tell you when the Bible said that they would have, that they would be without natural affection? It's not just talking about perversion. We're dealing with people that don't even have whole segments of their emotional makeup. They don't know what it is to have a daddy at home. They don't know what it is to have a loving mama. They don't know what it is to have an intact family unit. They don't know how to be husbands. They don't know how to be wives because they never had an example in front of them. They do not have natural affection. 
I understand the obstacles. I understand the barriers and the challenges, and they are overwhelming. Amen. And I also know that there are unique circumstances as you go from place to place and from area to area. Every pastor is having to deal with his own situation. And sometimes the solution in one place is not necessarily the solution in another. There are no quick fixes. There isn't one size fits all that we could just say, here's what you do, amen, and it'll work every single time. Amen. We're all scratching around trying to find the best way and trying to find the mind of God. So having said all of that, can I nevertheless say this evening, is it okay, hallelujah, is it okay if in spite of all of that, amen, like Jesus, we can look around at the masses and the multitudes around us and be moved, amen, because of their lost condition. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm prepared to preach with or without your help tonight. The city of Sao Paulo, amen, has over 20 million people. That means you could put almost the entire population of California in one city. If you had 1,000 churches in Sao Paulo, and each of them with an average attendance of 200 people, so that you could convene a ministerial conference with just the pastors of those churches, you would have 1,000 pastors, amen, each of them representing 200 people. You would still have one, only 1%, one only 1% one of that vast city. And can I tell you, that's just one of them. The globe is dotted with them. They are everywhere. Huge metropolises, huge areas filled with teeming masses of people wandering around while we're sitting right here tonight rejoicing in the presence of God. Amen. They don't have a clue. They don't know who Jesus is. They don't know about Calvary. They don't know about the blood. And they don't know about the oneness of the Godhead. Hey Amen. I fly into cities like Los Angeles. And I, I, just get, I, I just get overwhelmed. I look down at the carpeted landscape of building after building, subdivision after subdivision. Oh, amen, a mile square, uh, just filled with people everywhere. Going to Chicago, New York City, the other large areas of our own country, of our own shares, uh, shores, uh, not to mention, uh, amen, all of the other smaller cities uh, and even the rural areas. Uh, and forgive me if I'm strange, uh, if I'm weird, if there's something wrong with me. Uh, but there's a lot of times I get tears in my eyes and I think, God, what are we supposed to be doing? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. I don't mean to imply this evening that my burden is greater than anybody else's. Far from that. Amen. There are times when I'm disgusted with myself and I'm dissatisfied with my own selfishness. Amen. But, but the question I think that begs to be asked tonight is, what can we do? I find myself over and over asking the, myself the question, Jonathan Alviar, are you in the will of God? You see, it's too late, my friends. It's too late in the day. The hour is far spent. We don't have time to waste with lost causes. We don't have time to spin our wheels. We don't have time to go through the motions. We don't have time. 
time to play games. We don't have time to just come and juke and jive and feel like we've had church. I'm telling you, there is something that beats in the heart of Almighty God. And I feel that it is beating in this house tonight. Amen. As Jesus looked over the multitudes and he was moved with compassion because they fainted. They were like sheep without a shepherd. And he said, the harvest is there. The harvest is there. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and let's talk to the Lord for a moment. Praise God. Hallelujah. Come on, talk to him, would you? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, I feel an uneasiness in this congregation, but I hope we can move past that tonight. Just about everybody here has heard me preach at some time or another. You know what I stand for. Amen. I'm not up here trying to to tell us uh, that we need to sell out, uh, give in, uh, turn loose, uh, or let go. Hallelujah. But I am going to preach to you what I feel in my heart uh, because I do believe that contained within these verses is the answer. Thank God the Bible does not just identify the problem it gives you the answer. You don't need me to tell you. Hear it from Jesus himself. When he identified the problem, and this is what he said, Pray, pray ye, therefore, the Lord of the harvest. And I'm here to tell you in Jesus' name, that we're not in this by ourselves. We're not left to try to figure it out. The move of the Holy Ghost can't take care of. And I still believe that just as he did it then, and he's been doing it all these years, he can do it yet today. He can raise up others. Perhaps even by unlikely means and in unlikely places. Praise the Lord. Oh, yes, he can. Oh, yes, don't tell me he can't. I am a personal witness. I am a recipient. Praise God. Amen. You see, amen, I wasn't always in the oneness movement. When I, amen, was born until I was four, almost five years old. My father was a Trinitarian preacher. Came up out of the country of Chile. And then he started preaching when he was 11 years old. Amen, I visited the church where my dad grew up. Visited with the pastor's son who is himself now a very elderly man. Amen. They used to put a box behind the pulpit when my dad was 11 years old and he preached. He preached all of his life. Amen. My mother is American. They met through a, circ a set of circumstances I won't go into, but they got married. They first went to Bolivia and then together they felt impressed to go to Brazil. They went to Brazil, and after a long sequence of events there, amen, we're at the leadership of one of the fastest growing churches in South America with a membership of over 8,000 people in just a short time. My dad was 27 years old. And one day, an apostolic preacher came to Brazil on a little, just a little sachet through South America and heard about what was going on 
They were having services in the civic center, civic auditorium. He came and visited. My dad was impressed to have an American preacher with them. He had no clue that there was any difference in their doctrine. Invited him to the platform and then let him testify, which he did. Amen. It was Brother Frank Muncy. He testified, didn't say one thing about one God or Jesus name baptism, just greeted the congregation and left and came back to the States. But as fate, no, as God would have it, a few months later, my mother, who was from the area around Chicago, Illinois, came to visit her family. She came with my younger brother and my oldest sister to visit her family. Ended up at Grand Central Station in Chicago and missed her train. Was going to have to stay overnight. Then she remembered that this man that had visited them, amen, lived in Hammond, Indiana, just a short distance away. She looked up his phone number and called him. He said, stay right there. Don't leave. My wife and I are coming to get you. They came and picked her up. She stayed two or three days in their home. Before she left, he had baptized her in Jesus' name. Can I, just, can I just tell the story a little bit here tonight? Amen. Amen. So she went back to Brazil, afraid to say anything to my dad. He was one of those macho Latin Americans. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Might as well say amen. Hallelujah. And so she was afraid. But one day, my dad went to the post office, and here was a letter from Brother Frank Muncy. He did not notice that it was addressed to my mother. He thought it was addressed to him. He opened it and read it. And it said, how does your husband feel about you being baptized in Jesus' name? Praise the Lord. He went home shaking that letter in my mother's face. What does this mean? So she had to fess up. And he said, you either recant this false doctrine by such and such a date or we are going our separate ways and she wrote an SOS to the states Brother Muncy started calling around the country several preachers put their money together and they they got plane tickets amen and about three or four of them uh, then got ready to travel to Sao Paulo Brazil they sent a telegram but as it was often in those days the telegram never arrived. It was either the day or the day before the ultimatum. My mother didn't know what she was going to do. Amen. When there was a knock on the door, my dad was out of the house at that time, and she opened the door, and there stood Brother Frank Muncy and those other preachers from the States. They looked like angels to her. They had arrived at the airport, Nobody to meet them just gave a taxi driver the address and trusted him to take them where they needed to go. When my father walked in a little while later and saw them sitting there, he knew immediately why they were there. They arose to greet him. He said, sit down. We start talking now. That's the way he talked. Amen. And so they sat down. And for the next nearly three days, they debated back and forth the oneness of the Godhead, the Trinity doctrine, or so-called doctrine. Hallelujah. And my dad was no dummy. He was a Bible scholar. He gave as good as he got until both sides had exhausted their arguments and then sat back exhausted. And my dad, not willing to reject it if it was true, said, I've got to go think about this. I've got to go pray about this. And so late at night, he took a bus or a taxi some way. He got downtown where there's always people walking at all hours of the night in that massive city. And he was walking around in all of those scriptures and all of that information. 
amen, all jumbled around, floating around, and he was troubled. And this is how he puts it. All of a sudden, it was just like the pieces of a puzzle. They all just came together. And he saw it. And he stopped on the sidewalk in the late of the night and lifted his hands with tears running down his face. Amen. And began to thank God for a revelation. Went back to the house where they were all anxiously waiting. Walked in with a big smile on his face and said, I see it. Take me and baptize me in Jesus' name. Can you just let me obey the Lord here tonight? First thing he thought about was all those folks that he had baptized in Chile in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He sent a telegram to his parents that he was coming. Again, he got there before the telegram. Arrived, nobody to meet him at the airport. Took a taxi to their home in Puente Alto, which is not far from Santiago, Chile, where he grew up. Amen. The taxi is waiting outside. He walks in. His family looks up startled. They think maybe something horrible has happened because they didn't know he was coming. And then he said, no, no, everything's fine. I have just received the greatest revelation that God can give to man. My grandfather, amen, had one arm cut off in an industrial accident and yet uh, he had established little churches all up and down the coast of chile they were poor as job's turkey my grandmother made pastries and my dad sold them on the street as a teenager and that's how they survived barefooted i mean they lived in abject poverty and they, yet my grandfather was a stoic man he looked like a general in his bearing. He had never cried that anybody could remember. But he began to weep right then after my dad was blurting it out while the taxi driver still waiting for his money. And my grandfather said, son, up till now I have been your pastor. But today I want you to be my pastor and take me and baptize me in Jesus' name. I'm not telling you a fairy tale. This is the truth. Amen. They baptized whole churches. Whole churches in Jesus' name. A great revival broke out in the country of Chile. He didn't get quite that reception in Brazil. He got back and the folks that he had that he was aligned with and the preachers that he was hooked up with turned on him amen and of course my dad withdrew from them he came out of them and as far as I know never tried to go back I'm telling you I don't have a lot of sympathy for folks that want to sell out this message And there came days of intense persecution and opposition. They got the city leaders together and told them that my father was preaching heresy, that he needed to be thrown out of the country. And so he received a summons from City Hall to come and meet the leaders of the city and give an account for himself and that his residential status was being uh, in question. Hallelujah. He went with nothing but a Bible in his hand. Sat down in that room. We have pictures of it to this day. Here's all these dignitaries sitting around. And they said, Reverend, these are the charges that have been brought against you. Now then, before we take action, we want to know just what is it that these people are so upset about? My dad said, I'm glad that you asked. 
he opened his Bible to Acts chapter 2 and began to pass it around the room and show them scripture after scripture and let them read it for themselves. And finally, they all shook their heads and they said, as far as we can see, they have no case. We've read it for ourselves. Instead of evicting him from the country, they gave him a gold medallion, honoring him as an honorary citizen of the city of Sao Paulo. We have it to this day. And they said, as a gesture of good faith, we are going to give you five minutes on the president's national radio broadcast. It ended up not being five minutes. It ended up being 25 out of the 30 minutes. And from north to south, east and west in Brazil, my father preached, there is just one God, and his name is Jesus. Bear with me. This message is not about my dad. Bear with me. Just let me speak what I feel. Hallelujah. Amen. Some few years later, he bumped into one of his old uh, comrades in, in the downtown area. A man by the name of Manuel de Mello. By now, he was building one of the largest church buildings in all of Brazil. It looks like a huge airplane hangar. They tell me it will seat over 20 thousand people they had just the concrete bleachers in place and the concrete pillars no roof on it yet he bumped into my dad this is one of the guys that had tried to have him thrown out of the country and he said look we're going to have a special service to commemorate this phase of the building program we would like for you to come preach and my dad said you know good and well that I can't come preach for you. And he said, why not? He said, because you know what I'm going to preach when I get there. And he said, come anyway. Now this is not hearsay. I was there. I was there when in front of a crowd of I don't know how many thousands of people, my dad preached Acts 2, 38. And Jesus name baptism. Now those of you that knew my dad in the last few years did not know him in the years of his strength. You knew just a shadow of him, just a caricature of his old self. What I remember was a man that was in perpetual motion. It was radio program early in the morning, several services all day long, church somewhere every night, preaching, 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 going, coming, traveling all the time, all the time. All the time, we paid a high price for it. Our family paid a high price for it. But he was driven. He was on a burn. He couldn't stop. So that by the time, amen, it was over. And I regret to say that I buried my dad last December. Amen, he died. And I'm a little bit nostalgic because the last time I preached here, he was sitting right over there about where Brother Price is tonight. Amen. And I miss him here this evening. But by the time we buried him, between those that he had won, between those that he had baptized in Jesus' name and raised up and taught, and others that he had baptized, and they launched their own ministries, there were upward of 10,000 people baptized in Jesus' name. I am here to tell you, the Lord of the harvest knows how to get it done. Again, I am not here to preach about my dad. That's just an example that's very personal to me. I know it for myself. I know it from first-hand experience. Amen. I grew up in that household. And, and, and I hope a little of it rubbed off on me. Because I'm going to tell you, I love this message from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. 
I told my dad before he died, I said, when you go, I don't covet one thing you have, because you've already given me the best thing you could ever give me, and that is a love for this apostolic message. So what I am trying to say is that God knows how to raise up harvesters. Pray ye, therefore, the Lord of the harvest. You know, the Bible tells about a man who most people would not have approached on their own. He was a Roman centurion by the name of Cornelius. But there was something about Cornelius that God knew that nobody else knew, that he was a devout man and that he prayed all the time and he had a heart that was inclined and he was in the middle of a several day fast seeking the Lord and my God dispatched an angel to where he was and this is what the angel said now this wasn't the angel that Jimmy Swagger got hey amen I used to work as a radio announcer in a station that was owned by Jimmy Swagger in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. No, I was not a part of his evangelistic association. Amen. But I heard him say with my own ears that he had a visitation from an angel one night and that he asked the angel, he said, you know, this great controversy between which is right, the Trinity or the oneness. Why don't you tell me which is right? And the angel said the Trinity was right. If any man or angel come to you preaching any other gospel than that which you have received of us, let him be accursed. Any real bona fide angel knows there is just one God. But God sent an angel to Cornelius, and the angel didn't even tell him the message. He just said, send for a man. I'm going to tell you what man to send for. And he identified the man. And then he went over there and started working on the man. And Peter is sound asleep. He has no idea that he is on the edge of something big. But he gets a vision of a big cloth descending with animals that were considered unclean. And God said, rise, Peter, slay and eat. And Peter said, oh, no. Amen. I have prided myself in being really orthodox along these lines. And I, amen, will not touch what is unclean. And God said, how dare you call unclean what God has made clean. And then he made clear what his mission was. And God had to tune Peter up. The same man that had stood boldly on the day of Pentecost and said, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. God had to tune him up. So here he comes, a little uneasy with trepidation. Amen. What are the elders going to think? I'm just telling you what happened. So he took a few witnesses along just to make sure that they would report that he had not compromised. And he preached to them. He preached to them. And Cornelius didn't do this in secret knowing the man of God was on his way. I'm telling you, there's some hungry people out there. Not everybody's going to have to be put in a full Nelson. Not everybody's going to have to be wrestled intellectually. Not everybody's going to have to be coerced. 
threatened or intimidated. There's going to be some people, they're already hungry. God knows who they are. And he had already gone out there and gathered up a whole group of folks, family and friends and neighbors and I don't know who all, and the house was full. And while Peter yet spake these words, oh God, give us those days again. In fact, it wouldn't hurt my feelings if it happened right here tonight. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them that heard of them. be seated. Here is a man who is a persecutor of the church, whose very name strikes terror in the hearts of believers. Saul of Tarsus. You never wanted to find out that Saul was headed your way, because it always meant something bad. And God tapped on one man's shoulder one day and said, Ananias, Saul is coming to you. You know, there's a whole lot the Bible doesn't tell us. I'm convinced of that. I'm convinced there was a little argument that ensued there that we don't really, it's not recorded for us, but it probably went something like, uh, you, you don't mean that's all. Not the Saul of Tarsus. Yes, Ananias. That Saul, and behold, he prayeth. I've got him on his knees. He's praying right now. And he said, don't be afraid. He is a chosen vessel unto me. And he is going to take this to the Gentile. And he's going to stand before King. Don't be afraid. Now the story of Saul's conversion is a dramatic story. But I think not one whit behind it all is the fact that there was a man heretofore unknown, and after that he fades out of the picture. But he was in tune enough with God that when God needed him at that moment, he knew who to call on. And Ananias fulfilled a secondary role. But this is what he did. He just walked into the house where Saul was. And he said, Brother Saul, God that met you in the way has sent me. That I might pray for you that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Oh, it's quiet and uneasy now because people are wondering aloud, you, you mean, uh, what do you mean by that? If you've been paying attention, you know that I'm not talking about compromising the message. You know, that, that's one thing my dad never did was compromise the message. In fact, he was to a Trinitarian preacher what Brother Danny Perdue is to an elk. He was relentless, and they had no chance. And I don't know how many he baptized in his time, but one man I can tell you about that was baptized just four years ago. His name is Brother Renault Vieta de Souza. He is a, an evangelist, was an evangelist of the Trinitarian movement in Brazil. He is a highly educated man with a doctorate degree. He holds a office in the Ministry of Education in the city of Brasilia, in the capital of Brazil. For many years, a very distinguished and very, uh, uh, and, and very well-liked man of high position and very high caliber. He has preached in over 500 cities in Brazil. My uncle has started working on him and witnessing to him years ago. And he was, he was willing to listen, but he still had a hang-up. 
And one day they had to come to the States, the two of them. And he said, I want to go by California and visit your brother. I'd like to talk to him about this. He came into my dad's house and sat down. And they had been there scarcely 10 minutes when the man said, Reverend, there is something that's troubling me. And he asked him a question. And my dad answered it. And the man fell out of his chair onto his knees with his hands up and began to glorify God and said, baptize me in Jesus' name. That man preached in my church two weeks ago. He preached on the essentiality of being baptized in Jesus' name. I took him with me to the Apostolic Doctrine and Holiness Conference in Wichita, Kansas. He has a revelation, but he, has, he needs help in other areas. He sat there soaking it all up at the airport as we were leaving. He said he was all excited. He said, we've got to start, we've got to start a teaching institute of some kind. You've got to come. You've got to bring others. You've got to teach us. There's so much that we need to know. My dad was never, never stopped looking for another harvester. Somebody who would take this message to many. Can you bear with me a little longer? Just a little longer, I promise. Never stop looking. Amen. Amen. I wonder tonight, I wonder tonight if God could trust us with a chosen vessel. Because you see, I believe that since He is the Lord of the harvest, you know, we look out there and it's like looking for a needle in the haystack. We don't even know where to begin. But God knows where they're at. And He's got His hand on them right now. And sometimes He hides them from us because we would just blow them out of the water. But if God can ever get to where He trusts us, and He would bring us together, somehow cause paths to cross, Amen. We have no idea what God is able to do in our time. I believe as I get ready to close that there are three things that are absolutely essential and this is our part. Number one, I believe that we have to have a conviction. We've got to be more convinced than we've ever been that this is the only message. It is the only message. You clapped real politely right then, but I'm telling you, you got to get passionate about this. I'm going to tell you, when I was evangelizing full-time, nothing would gall me as much as to have visitors in the house and start preaching the old-fashioned salvation doctrine, the old-fashioned plan of salvation, and have those old mature saints just slump over and get that bored look on their face, like, yeah, yeah, we heard it all, but if there is any time that you need to come to your feet. This isn't one way, it is the only way. We heard it today, except you believe that I am He, you shall die in your sins. Amen. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. You've got to be baptized. It is essential. And if it's essential to be baptized, there's an essential way to be baptized. 
Come on, apostolics, we got to get a conviction about this. I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost, it's time for us to quit paying lip service to it. We say it's the only message. We look down our noses at everybody else, but then we're content to sit on our laurels. If we get a conviction about this, it comes along with a responsibility. If this is the only way, we better be doing something about it. So secondly, there not only needs to be a conviction, there needs to be a commitment. A commitment paid on the part of every believer. I don't know what your role is, I don't know what your place is. If you're a member of a church, you have to, you have to pray about that and talk that over with your pastor. But there is a place for everybody, there's a work for everybody. There has to be a commitment on the part of everyone. Amen. And I'm talking about not only here at home, but abroad as well. Be seated. I'm going to talk to you for a minute. I sat in the living room one night, amen, and I heard several men talking. And this is something that was said, and I couldn't believe my ears. The statement that was made was, missions has been the biggest waste of our money, of anything that we've ever done. had the gall to say that in my presence, knowing that I grew up on the mission field, that I was a product of what we're talking about here tonight. Number one, let's get something straight. It's not our money. And as soon as we start thinking it's our money, God knows how to shut the faucet off. Number two, amen, I'm telling you, there is no greater investment that anybody can make than investing in the kingdom of God, not just at home, but abroad. It's got to go beyond just putting it all where we can enjoy the benefit of it. Putting it all within our four walls, within our own little ministry. I'm trying to be very careful tonight. In fact, I have prayed much in the last few days because I know that everything we preach is intensely analyzed, scrutinized, and dissected. And sometimes you get in trouble not because what you say is wrong, but because you say it wrong. And I don't want to say it wrong. I have prayed and asked God, help me to weigh my words and articulate it so that I don't offend anybody. Unless I don't want to offend anybody. Amen. Can I tell you, my friends, amen, let, let, me, let me speak as, 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 a, as a part of the ministry now. Amen. Let's build our churches as beautiful, as grand, as wonderful as we can possibly build them. But if we don't have a missionary vision along with it, it will perish with us. I mean, make it, make it as nice as you can make it. Praise the Lord, and I'm not trying to give any disgruntled saint ammunition to use against their pastor. You just follow your pastor and whatever he's doing and believe that he's doing the right thing. But sometimes when five or ten thousand dollars can build a whole little church on a foreign mission field, we need to re-examine our priorities. Do we really believe this is the only way? Oh, it's a terrible time to start walking through a minefield at the end of a message. But I believe it requires a personal commitment. I'm going to say this very carefully because uh, I, I'm not, uh, this is, you know, this is something that you normally just keep to yourself. But after evangelizing for many years, pulling trailers across the country and pickup trucks, trying to get every bit of mile mileage out of them we could, and then settling down with the small, small children and, and driving minivans, 
I finally decided I am going to buy a car. And I went and I picked out the nicest car I could find that I thought we could afford. And oh, it was nice. It was beautiful. I'm just going to speak for myself now. Amen. You just hear me out and I'll try to balance it all, okay? Amen. I went in there and oh, it was pretty. My wife, my kids were just drooling over it. We could just see ourselves cruising the conference in that thing. Amen. And I went in there to the little office. It was at closing time. In fact, it was past closing time. They were waiting for me to close the deal so they could all go home. At the same time, there was an older couple that had come in. They were wanting to trade a vehicle they had on that car. And they're standing out there waiting for me to make my decision. I sat down in there and suddenly my heart smote me. And I told the salesman, I said, can you give me just five minutes, please? Just would you leave the room for five minutes? He went out of the room and I put my head down and I prayed. And I said, God, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm not going to buy this car. And I'm going to give you the payment of this car to missions for one year. Personally. Because I believe you have to make a personal commitment. You can't just hide behind what your church is doing. You have to make a personal commitment. I am in no way suggesting anybody here should do the same thing that I did. Amen. And by the way, if you're a member of a church, anything you do should always go through your church and through your pastor. You don't support missions independent of your pastor and your church. Woo, did it get quiet there or did I just, did the PA go off suddenly? Amen. You don't do none of that without the pastor. Oh, in fact, you don't slip money to the evangelist without it going through the pastor. Oops, we took a little detour there, didn't we? Amen. There's always those they want to show how spiritual they are. Amen. They're not going to put it in the offering because they don't trust their pastor to put it where it ought to go. So they want to go behind the scenes and, and deal with the missionary, with the evangelist one-on-one. -on -one. You don't do anything independent of your church. You trust him to have the right vision. And if his vision is different than what I'm preaching tonight, you follow his vision. I walked out of that dealership and I went back by a few minutes later and that couple was getting in my car. And I went home and my wife said, where's the car? And I said, I didn't buy it. And you know, there's another part of that. We still haven't bought it. And it's been several years and when we finally went to buy another vehicle, I bought another van. Amen. But I'm not complaining. Because God has blessed us over and beyond measure. I'm closing in about three minutes, but you hear me carefully. I was a little boy in a city of 20 million people, and God found me there. And I'm standing here tonight because of His goodness and His grace. What right do I have to complain about anything? Let's all stand this evening. Elder, it's what I feel in my heart. Hallelujah. I want us to lift our hands and I want us to talk to the Lord for just a moment. Hallelujah. 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 I told you there were three things that we needed. One was conviction. Second was commitment. The third one is found here in this passage when Jesus looked on the multitudes. 
He was moved with compassion. I'm not talking about pity. I'm talking about something deeper than that. In fact, no one has articulated it as good, as far as I'm concerned, as another good missionary friend of mine did just a few days ago, Brother Brad Lambeth from Brazil, another place farther south. His dad lies near death right now. Another great apostle gave his all for the loss of that country. I visited him just a few months ago. He can't even talk. He can't move either his arms or his legs. Elder J.B. Lambeth, just a human vegetable. His son, Brother Brad Lambeth, is near my age. I have adopted him as my brother. He's my brother. This is the way he put it the other day, and I thought it was so appropriate. He said, when you have compassion for people, you don't just pity them. You begin to feel what they're feeling. There is a sick, there is a hurting, there is a dying world out there. I'm sorry, I wish I could have come and preached something that would have got us all just running the aisles. But I had to be true with my heart. And I feel like the presence of God is here tonight saying, if you will get into my work, my vision, my spirit. How hard is it to pray for something that God already wants? That God already is willing to do? And yet he said, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he may send forth laborers into the harvest. You know what? It won't be hard for us to pray if we get a spirit of compassion like we've never had before. Oh, I wish that at the end of this service, there would be a spirit of compassion that would descend on this assembly. I don't know what God wants to do here tonight, but I, I have wondered, what if out of this conference, what if out of this conference would arise such a clamor, such a cry, such a prayer that would ascend up before the throne of the Lord of the harvest, that he would begin to move this one and move that one Lift your hands and worship the Lord, will you? Hallelujah, hallelujah. 